So Matt, today we're reviewing The Master Algorithm by Pedro Domingos. So like all great modern data science books, there's about 10 pages of confusion of whether the author's talking about machine learning or AI. It turns out Pedro Domingos is a professor of CS at the University of Washington, and he is in fact talking about machine learning. Now, the core principle behind the book is that there is some master algorithm out there that could unite all schools of machine learning we have today and could bring us into a golden age of science and technology. Yes, so Domingos kind of impresses on us early the importance of machine learning, as if we didn't know it already. You know, things like recommendation systems, it's being used in medical research, self-driving cars, you, know, you name it, machine learning is going to affect our lives in, in some way. Um, but as Domingos points out, right now there are a ton of different algorithms that are being used. You have things like neural nets, Bayesian networks, all kinds of things with different pros and cons, and no one has really found a way to sort of unite the best of all of them into a single algorithm. So you can kind of think of this process as analogous to you know, Einstein's theory of relativity, um, whereby that led to the standard model of physics. And a universal algorithm could basically take you know, all the best of deep learning, Bayesian statistics, what have you, and create the one true algorithm to rule them all. Absolutely. And this gets to the core hypothesis of the book, which is that all knowledge, past, present, and future, can be derived from data by a single universal learning algorithm. Yes, this algorithm seems like something that be, could be quite useful. Uh, were you able to find it? Um, but in the meantime, Domingos kind of divides the current state of knowledge in machine learning into five distinct schools of there's thought. There's five schools of thought? Yes, there's one more oh. machine learning school of thought than there are houses in Hogwarts. And I don't want to bore everyone with the details too much, but I do think it's helpful to kind of give a general overview of where Domingos is coming from with these. So school number one is the symbolists. Now, the symbolists are super traditional learners. They use things like inverse deduction, uh, they like writing proofs, um, and if you've ever heard you know, the classic deduction of Socrates is a mortal, um, you'll sort of know where they're coming from with their style of learning. Now, school number two, much more modern than the symbolists, it's the connectionists. Connectionists see the best way to learn as looking at the human brain. Now, they're not necessarily dissecting people to do this, but they are trying to kind of replicate the known structure of the brain in the learning algorithms they create. So they initially did something called the perceptron way back in the day. And since then, they've moved on to things like neural networks, which are super prevalent in things like deep learning and are really kind of the frontier of ML in a lot of ways. Now, the third score, we're getting more into statistics here, is the Bayesians. Now, Bayesians look at things from sort of a probabilistic perspective uh, compared to the other groups. Um, so they'll not just only think about the data they have on hand for a certain problem, but they'll also try and combine information about their prior beliefs you know, about the issue or anything else they know about the world, really. Yeah, that's where you would find modern-day demigod Nate Silver. <laughs> yes, when uh, Nate is cooking up those predictions, you know, combining those polls together, um, he's generally learning some, using some kind of Bayesian methodology. Uh, now, school number four is the evolutionaries. Uh, they're a little bit different to the others in that they really see things like survival of the fittest and Darwinism as being the best way to progress and learn. Um, and so they try and incorporate the concepts of evolution um, into their algorithms. Things like genetic algorithms um, are really kind of you know, their expertise. Now, the fifth and final school is the analogizers. Now, this is probably the most general, I would say the hardest to define of the five. Um, but essentially, as the name suggests, analogizers are interested in learning from analogy. Um, so this is something that humans are generally pretty good at, and computers can really struggle with. Um, so an example here is something like a small child uh, looking at a dog. Now, they'll be able to figure out that the dog is not just this one single thing. The, the term dog is sort of a generalizable concept that you know, applies to poodles and golden retrievers. Um, but teaching a computer to, to do something like this can actually be really, really difficult. Uh, and so analogizers are really focused on these kinds of problems. Yeah, Adam, I cannot wait to find where the sorting hat places me, but which of these schools do you identify the most with? So I would probably put myself in partly in the connectionist camp and partly in the Bayesian camp, just based on kind of big data work and statistics background and all these different kinds of things. Uh, but, you know, unlike Hogwarts, where, you know, you really don't want to go to Slytherin unless you're evil, um, there's really, like, no bad option with these schools. I mean, they each have kind of their own pros and cons, the things they figured out, you know, the, the reasons for being. There isn't really a bad one. Yeah, I think something that, you know, just reading the book you may not get on the surface is that there is a lot of overlap between these particular areas. It's not like data scientists are out there fighting about, you know, what camp they fall into and there's some war going on. Um, you just need to use all of these if you're a data scientist today. So... Perhaps to the reader who's thinking, oh, yeah, these guys are, are definitely not getting along. That's not true. 
Yes, I've never gone up to someone and said, you're a symbolist, like, I'm never going to talk to you, because uh, we just fundamentally disagree on everything. No, but um, Dominguez, I think, is writing to a pretty general audience with the Master Algorithm, uh, and for that reason, like, he's created these segments just to make things more memorable and easy to understand, but they really, like, shouldn't be taken, you know, absolutely literally. Um, but with these segments, I think Dominguez does a good job of kind of explaining the core concepts of each of the five schools. I mean, the bulk of this book is just going through these five and kind of explaining the things that they're working on, the kinds of algorithms they use, that sort of thing. And so in the Bayesian chapter, for example, I mean, you really get kind of like your classic Bayesian intro 101. I mean, we have a, you know, your coin flipping example, which by law, you know, every Bayesian text must include. Um, you also have your, your drug trial example, um, whereby you get tested to see if you have a particular disease. Um, and based on the result of a test, as well as the, the prevalence of a disease in a population, um, you can figure out the probability that you actually have the disease. Um, so there's all these kinds of classic Bayesian examples in here. Uh, but having said that, like sometimes for me, it was hard to follow. I mean, there's just so much information coming at you. Um, something like MCMC is in here, um, which is a, a Bayesian concept for basically sampling from a posterior distribution. Now, going into this book, I felt like I had a pretty good grasp on what MCMC was, uh, but when I read the Bayesian chapter and I just went through the description and it's so quick and there aren't really any kind of visual aids for you, um, it became like pretty difficult to follow. And so, you know, especially for schools where maybe you're not as versed in them, um, I found that the book was just fast paced and a little hard to keep track of at times. Yeah, you know, the book does a great job of explaining everything with analogy and with real world examples. There's very little math in the book. I almost think none at all. And because of this, I wondered if it struggled a bit at times to explain some of these more difficult concepts. I felt exactly like you did, which is there were lots of things I thought I understood really well. And I wasn't sure if it was just the presentation or just a different perspective that made it more difficult for me to understand them. So I definitely agree on that point. Uh, we should also say this book is really popular with people who are not in this field. So Bill Gates, Xi Jinping, leader of China, uh, also loves this book. And so it obviously has widespread you know, appeal. And I wonder how some of those people perceived these topics. Uh, well, they were probably enticed by the very catchy title of, you know, the master algorithm. It sounds quite impressive. Uh, and so you're probably watching this wondering if, you know, Pedro does actually end up finding a master <laughs> algorithm at the end of this book. Um, and the answer is sort of, I would say, kind of. Um, he proposes something called a, a Markov logic network, uh, which has kind of been part of his research. Um, and this sort of aims to combine some of the concepts from the different schools. Um, but Dominguez himself admits that, you know, it's not necessarily ready for prime time at this point. I mean, it can't handle big data. Um, there's a lot of kind of knobs that need to be turned to, to tune it correctly. There's a lot of data prep work that goes into it beforehand. Uh, and so he sort of says that theoretically this kind of thing could become the must algorithm, but it's not really there yet. And you know, you're probably just better off running a neural net at this point. Yeah. Instead of talking about the five schools, which Pedro Dominguez himself explains very well in a series of videos online, I think we should talk about the two core concepts that kind of bookend the five schools. The first is the philosophy behind analytics, data science, etc. And the second is the future implications if such an algorithm is developed. So first, let's talk about the philosophy behind this book. So Domingo says there's kind of two core camps that people fall into. The first is an empiricist, and the second is a rationalist. Now, an empiricist wants to look at the world, make some observations, and decide from that what the true knowledge is. A rationalist wants to come up with a theory, have that represent knowledge, and understand that oftentimes the data has a bit of noise and won't match their theory. Now, he goes into a really detailed comparison of the two, but Adam, where do you see yourself in this you know, dichotomy? Uh, so I've always seen myself as an empiricist. I want to get all that data. We've got to model it. You know, I've got to believe in the power of data. You know, good data beats you know, good algorithm any day of the week. Um, but I did really enjoy kind of a historical perspective that Dominguez brought on this. Um, I always enjoy uh, reading about Hume, uh, the philosopher, um, who's kind of like the wet blanket of philosophers in many ways, and that everyone else is coming up with these sort of amazing discoveries and, and you know, theories and ideas. And then Hume sort of comes in and says, well, it, it's never really possible to sort of know anything. Um, mm -hmm. You can never really learn from generalization, you know, just because one thing is true today, just because the sun rose today, you know, you, have, you don't know that it's going to rise tomorrow. You can never truly know anything like that. Yeah, there's the perfect example of the Bertrand Russell story about the turkey. Do you want to go into that? Yeah. Uh, so Bertrand Russell uh, wrote the history of Western philosophy, um, very well-known figure. Um, and he has this famous uh, story about a turkey. 
um, where each day, you know, the turkey is, is fed. Um, it's fed at a particular time, 9 a.m., let's say. Um, and so, you know, a, a data scientist, say, studying this phenomenon um, would soon come up with an extremely confident prediction that every single day this turkey is going to be fed at 9 a.m. Um, and this model, this insight would work great. You, you take it to everyone you know, you present it at conferences, um, and things would be working really, really well until, you know, say, Christmas Eve, um, when instead of getting fed, you know, the turkey has its head chopped off. Um, and so, you know, at that point, your, your model isn't working so well. Um, your, you know, your assumption that this you know, 9 a.m. feeding would go on forever has been broken. And this is essentially what someone like Hume is getting at with the idea that just because it's happened however many times beforehand, you can never truly know, you know something like that. Yeah, and I'd say this is an unresolved question in the book. Domingos actually even calls this out that we don't really have an answer to this, which is you know, kind of going back to your point, good data beats a good model every time. So I don't even know with the master algorithm if this kind of problem will be solved. Because you can imagine, OK, well, now if we have data on holidays, maybe the turkey will get a little bit more knowledge and will be saved. But in reality, if this is random or this is a, more of a noise component, we're never going to be able to perfectly predict the turkey's outcome. And so I kind of see this as a big challenge, even given a master algorithm. Yes. Um, so the core concept of the master algorithm is that it could learn any knowledge that is possible to be known from data. Uh, now, that, like, from data is, I think, a very kind of important quantifier here. Um, and, the, you know, I think at best, a master algorithm would be able to say, perform better on any holdout data set for, you know, any input training data set than any other known algorithm could. You know, you could look at, you know, all the common machine learning data sets in the world, apply the master algorithm to it, and it would essentially, you know, win every Kaggle competition imaginable. Um, but Dominguez kind of gets into this with Hume and other parts of the book, but there is kind of a limitation on what is possible that we could ever, you know, actually know. Um, and the master algorithm isn't going to be able to take us beyond that. It's just going to be able to make better use of the data we've collected to begin with. Yeah, that's why I really see the focus of this book is probably being slightly misguided, which is, you know, even if we get a better master algorithm, what I really want is better data, right? If we could know, you know, for example, what people are thinking, what people are feeling, that's much more valuable, even given today's models, than a more advanced model that can sort of get 2 or 3% more accurate than what a neural net can give you today. Yes, uh, I think this kind of transitions into kind of the next discussion point of talking about what is the future, you know, if a master algorithm is created. Um, because I think you could immediately envision, you know, just kind of picking up this book, looking at the phrase master algorithm, and basically saying it would be some sort of Skynet, you know, world dominant type thing that would take over absolutely everything. You know, it's kind of reminiscent of a discussion we saw in uh, Superintelligence by Nick Bostrom, mm -hmm. uh, where Bostrom is really trying to hypothesize about, you know, as the frontiers of AI are pushed further and further out, as AI becomes much, much smarter than any human, kind of what would happen. Um, and, you know, his futures are pretty dystopian in terms of kind of mind control and, you know, human type farming matrix style outcomes that, that you might end up with. Yeah, I, I'm still in the Nick Bostrom camp. I know, Adam, you uh, probably found yourself a little bit more identifying with uh, Pedro Domingos in this book, where he sees it as a pretty rosy outlook, because if I'm interpreting this right, he said, uh, actually, a computer is only going to do what you ask it, and it's not nefarious. And so as long as we ask things correctly, it'll be fine. I think the... The limits of machine learning in terms of innovation um, are probably slightly overhyped. Machine learning can help you with something like a self-driving car, let's say, um, where you can take an existing product, you know, a car which is driven by a human, uh, and you could automate that all away, and you can make it incredibly efficient, so maybe we, we never get stuck in traffic. Um, but you're essentially just improving an existing task that has already been created. Um, like, true innovation, I don't think, could be you know, derived from a master algorithm. You know, a master algorithm could never say, you know, uh, create something like the internet just you know, off the top of its head. Um, it could never create something like a Google, the search engine, just off the top of its head. If you'd applied the master algorithm, you know, to instead of PageRank, you probably could have gotten better search results. But the initial spark of creativity and you know, focusing on that problem and kind of determining the parameters of that problem you know, a, a very much a human thing that I don't think a master algorithm is going to get the ability to do. Yeah, of course. Now, if we believe the master algorithm is all powerful, there's no reason to think we couldn't put some of those human elements in the algorithm itself. But it definitely made me think a little bit about the you know super intelligence point of view that this could be super dangerous. Um, but I think one of the parts that 
is not called out enough is that even when we make a you know perfect uh, ask of the computer, if you will, it can still do things we really don't like. So the classic example being, you know, I want you to make paper clips, but we don't tell it how many, so it turns the entire universe into a paper clip making factory. Yeah, Domingo sort of reassures us of Monster Algorithm by saying that you know it's just going to operate within the constraints we set. So like everything's cool, guys. Nothing's going to go wrong. Uh, but obviously, setting those constraints is difficult, especially if you want the thing to actually be useful. Um, and so, in that regard, you know, there are these problems that could arise. I mean, we've talked about this before. The you know, kind of negative side effects of algorithms, things like the compass recidivism algorithm, uh, predictive policing, you know, creating negative feedback loops. There's all kinds of examples where algorithms that are implemented do not kind of lead to beneficial outcomes. Yeah, the other topic that's not really discussed is the NP-complete, or hard-to-solve problems in some given amount of time. Uh, I think one of the things that's ignored here is that even if the master algorithm is perfect, and even if we have perfect data, it has to be able to compute that in yeah. some small amount of time. It doesn't do any good to have a perfect prediction of what will happen a week from now if it takes two weeks to calculate that. Yeah, and you've seen that with you know, Dominguez's own research with Markov logic networks, where in principle, they're a really, really cool idea uh, but he's kind of admitted to himself, you know, computationally, they're not the most, you know, efficient or effective. Another clever concept that's brought up in the book is the idea of a data collective or almost a data union. Now, this is really cool for two reasons. One, Dominguez almost says that in the future, people will want to own their own data source. They won't want to give it to you know, external companies, but they will want some way of leveraging the power of this information, and they could do so through a data collective. The interesting idea that he proposes that I hadn't really heard before was you would almost have a virtual avatar, a digital self, a model of you online that would allow different companies to interact with this model of you. Mm -hmm. And instead of you know really worrying about your presence online, you'd actually worry about your avatar's presence online. Yeah, Dominguez uh, you know, produces this really great sounding example of your digital self basically taking care of all the tedious elements of your life um, where you go and just you know, relax on the beach instead. Um, so you know, if you were you know, applying to like, graduate school or something and they, they wanted to interview you, um, you wouldn't actually have to go do that interview. It's far too tiresome, time consuming. Um, your digital self would basically go in your stead and it would know everything that you do and be able to give kind of an accurate representation of you know, your answers to all these questions. Um, now, this sounds very much kind of you know, science fiction, you know, uh, perhaps a dystopian future, depending on how you think about it. Uh, but Domingo is kind of thinking big in terms of how super advanced machine learning would affect our lives. Yeah. Now, the next concept that comes up, and I think one we're going to expand on in the future, is this idea of automation. What automation will mean for society. So one of the things that Domingo talks about that I thought was really cool was this idea of employment rate. That in the future, people won't talk about unemployment. They'll talk about their employment rate. So a country like the United States might say, actually, our employment rate is way too high. We need to lower this because we're getting beaten by other countries in the world. Yeah, there'd be a certain amount of cachet to lowering your employment rate because that would show how much you've been able to you know, automate away the, the menial tasks of society. So I'm kind of giving away my own opinions here a little bit, uh, but I don't really see this type of automation occurring anytime soon. Um, not only are there many kind of service sector jobs that I just think, you know, Automating a haircut is going to be much harder than people think it's going to be. Basically, my point here. Uh, but I also you have to work to get this. But, but I also think um, that there is going to be a lot of pushback against automating jobs um, because people don't want to lose that kind of sense of purpose and drive and, and things to do every day. And I think you would see a lot of negative societal consequences um, if all our jobs were automated away, even if you had sort of a, a universal basic income to try and replace that. Uh, but having said that, you know, that'll be our discussion for next time. Uh, this has been Random Talkers. Thank you very much for watching. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube, and we'll see you next time.